After graduating from high school, Natalie Holloway and her class travelled to the Caribbean island of Aruba for a week of partying. But on their final night of celebrating, no one expected this bright young woman to suddenly vanish. Natalie never made it to the airport, with her absence quickly gripping the island of Aruba and all of those back home. The spotlight would eventually find itself over one particular suspect, but it would take more than 10 years to get any justice, coming at the cost of years of frustration and even a second murder. This video looks at the terrible actions of Joran van der Sloot, the weight that Natalie's family had to carry for so many years, and sets us up for our next video to be released. I, I smash her head in with it completely. Welcome or welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime, folks. My name is Adrian, and today we're looking at the now-solved case of Natalie Holloway. Natalie's case made headlines all across the world for many years after her disappearance. And now finally, after more than a decade, we finally have closure. Now, not only is this story complex, but it also covers multiple murders. And so, with that in mind, I've decided to split it into two separate videos to give both victims the respect they deserve. With that said, the next one's out in a few days. By the way, if you like true crime, strange or darkly fascinating stories, then welcome to Coffeehouse Crime. I post twice a week here and I'd love it if you could subscribe. And also, welcome to autumn. The weather outside is colder, everything feels cosier, and apparently everyone with a leaf blower is right outside my studio. But it does make great weather for hot coffee, so if you haven't checked out Classified yet, please take a look. Cheers. Anyway, with all of that said, please grab yourself a coffee, pull up a seat, and get ready for the deep dive. This is the case of Natalie Holloway. Here's a new place for coffeehouse crime. Welcome to Aruba, folks. Located in the middle of the Caribbean Sea, Aruba is an exotic island with a lot of charm and intrigue. One thing that may surprise you, because it certainly surprised me, is that this island is actually a constituent country to the Netherlands. Now, apparently, most Arubans can speak at least four languages. They enjoy a vibrant lifestyle and even have their own brewery. And although it may be relatively small, it's one that adequately serves the tiny island. Another fun fact is that Aruba has the lowest crime rate in the entire of the Caribbean, which probably contributes to making this story almost entirely unbelievable. Before we find ourselves on this island, though, we must first travel 2,000 miles northwest to the state of Tennessee. And it's here that we could find the young woman, Natalie Holloway. Born on October the 21st, 1986, to her parents Dave and Elizabeth, Natalie was raised in Memphis, Tennessee. Things remained peaceful for the first few years of her life. But sadly, at the age of seven, her mother and father split up. Despite the divorce, she and her younger brother Matthew maintained a close relationship with both sides of their family. And although they were primarily raised by their mother, they saw their father as often as they could. It was three years after the divorce in 1996 that Elizabeth met a prominent businessman from Alabama named George Twitty. Known as a wealthy Southern gentleman, Elizabeth was immediately smitten by him and, perhaps no surprise, the two soon married afterward. With both children by her side, Elizabeth moved to the wealthy suburb of Mountain Brook located in Alabama, where Natalie and Matthew would enroll into their local school. And with both of them being bright and friendly, they quickly fit into their new surroundings. Taking after her mother, Natalie was the definition of a Southern Belle, with bright eyes, blonde hair, and a glowing smile, everyone who met her was awestruck. She was friendly and talkative, took the time to know everyone that she met, and by the time she graduated in the year 2005, was very popular and well-liked. As a model student and a member of the National Honor Society, she was also into dance class and various other activities. Now, as many of you will know, university in America can be extremely expensive. Students often incur hundreds of thousands of dollars of debt, especially in lengthy programs such as medical school. But despite having the wealth from her stepfather to support her education, Natalie actually had it covered by securing multiple scholarships. Scheduled to attend the University of Alabama on a full ride, Natalie had her whole life in front of her. However, before attending university, she was given one unique opportunity. Her high school offered her a class trip to the Caribbean island of Aruba to help celebrate their achievements. Now, many parents thought that, on the surface, this seemed like the perfect way for students to celebrate their graduation. I mean, this was a very big achievement, and not only would the parents have some time away from their children, but it would help let off 
some steam before they started university. But what many didn't realise was that, instead of a wholesome school-guided excursion, this trip was, in reality, a drinking and gambling field joyride. In Aruba, the legal age limit for drinking and gambling is 18 years old, which is in stark contrast to the 21-year-old age limit in the States. And while this difference may not seem like a big deal to those of us in Europe and Australia, in America, the drinking culture is very strictly defined by its age limit. Now, the opportunity for a trip to Aruba without any supervision from their parents was a very exciting prospect for graduates. Natalie was one of those people looking forward to drinking legally for once, and on a trip tropical island to boot. Well, imagine the immense feeling of freedom. And so, after asking her father to help fund the vacation and getting the green light from her mother, she was good to go. On Thursday, May the 26th of 2005, just a few days after her high school graduation, Natalie, alongside more than 120 fellow graduates, arrived in Aruba for an all-inclusive five-day celebration. Chaperones made sure that the students were staying safe. But, that being said, those students outnumbered them 17 to 1. So yeah, it was no surprise that it was almost impossible to keep tabs on every graduate on the island. The result was an almost unencumbered and unmonitored holiday, fueled by parties, alcohol, and everything else that you could imagine. Cocktails were flowing, the music was booming, and the sun was blisteringly hot. With all chaperones completely overwhelmed, they made it their job to catch up with all students daily to ensure that they were doing well, at least through the various hangovers. Natalie herself was included in this group by the way. According to other students, she was seen drinking pretty much all day every day. Friends reported that she was often waking up and starting the morning with cocktails, becoming so hungover that she missed breakfast twice in a row. To illustrate the complete chaos here, the owners of the Holiday Inn, where the group was staying, told the chaperones that, if they returned the following year, they were not welcome back at the hotel. And unfortunately, this sets the stage for our case today. A large group of adults partying both day and night with minimal supervision. What could possibly go wrong? On the last full day of their holiday, all students made it their mission to get their final party in before returning home. Natalie herself had just met a 17-year-old Dutch national named Joran van der Sloot, and, being Dutch, lived in the nearby town called Noord. The two started chatting and seemed to be enjoying each other's company. Which is probably no surprise why, later on, Natalie agreed to meet him for her last evening on the island. Later that evening, Joran and Natalie met at the popular Carlos and Charlie's bar in Orangestadt. The two shared several drinks and danced together, only stopping when the bar closed at 1am. As people gathered their belongings to leave the club, Natalie's friends noticed that she was preparing to hop into a car with Joran and his two friends. These friends named as Deepak and Satish Kalpo. Somewhat concerned, her friends asked her what her plan was and where she was going. In Natalie's mind, she was getting a ride back to her hotel to get a much-needed night's sleep before heading home. It is true, she could have gone back with her friends, but apparently this lift would have gotten her home faster. And sadly, as a result, this would be the last time that her friends would ever see her alive again. Scheduled to fly home the following day, Natalie was still missing after sunrise. At first, her friends assumed that she may have spent the night with Joran, but as the hours passed and their flight time approached, she was still nowhere to be found. And with her packed luggage and passport still in her room at the Holiday Inn, none of her friends or teachers could get in contact with her. At this point, they understandably all began to panic. Natalie was known to be responsible, always on time, and at the right place when she needed to be. To say it was worrying that she was now missing after a night out, and without any explanation whatsoever, was a massive understatement. Aruban authorities were notified of the missing girl, and as her classmates boarded the plane and left without her, the authorities began to search the island, looking for any signs or clues. As soon as her parents were notified, they too understandably began to worry, with Natalie's mother and stepfather flying out to the island via a private jet. Their daughter was now lost in a foreign country, and tragically, that was the very best outcome. At worst, it didn't even bear thinking about. 
But despite the local authorities knowing that the girl was now missing, they had made little effort so far in locating her. In fact, in the hours after her reported disappearance, they didn't do much more than search the areas she was last seen. Desperate for more information, Elizabeth and George questioned hotel staff and other holiday makers in the area, hoping that someone could help them. Speaking with anyone who would talk to them, their investigation ultimately guided them along Natalie's final steps the night before. After the hotel, they went to check out the bar Natalie was last seen at, of course being Carlos and Charlie's. It was there that they learned that their daughter had left the night prior with a young Dutch national, and with pretty good investigation skills, they would even discover his name, that being Joran van der Sloot. After eventually being located, Joran was questioned about Natalie's disappearance, and although he did seem to be calm, he did admit that he left the bar with her and two other friends. He also claimed that the four of them then drove to a lighthouse and spent around about an hour together, before going back back to the Holiday Inn and saying goodbye to Natalie. Taking her parents back to the hotel, Joran said he would then go find the security guard who saw Natalie last night. However, conveniently enough, that guard was nowhere to be found. By now though, Natalie's case had captured the island's attention, and although she was not officially a missing person yet, more than a hundred people were searching right across the island. Safe to say, the details behind a sudden disappearance were enough to concern anyone who learned of them so it was no surprise to see the community band together. For the next four days, ragtag teams of locals and tourists checked every corner of the island, hoping and praying to find her merely trapped or stranded, but in good health otherwise. On June the 5th, the authorities detained several corrupt security guards, hoping for a lead. Sadly though, it seemed they were barking up the wrong tree as all of those guards were released only eight days later. As the next step in their efforts, the police interrogated Joran's father, who, no surprise, remained silent throughout the interview. A local DJ also claimed to know something, but his information was proven to be false. And with both ventures seeming fruitless, both men were eventually let go. Five police in Aruba have made a new arrest in connection with the disappearance of Mountain Brook teenager Natalie Holloway. They've arrested the father of a Dutch teen who's been in custody for two weeks. The wife of Paul Vandersloo says her husband was just picked up by police. Anita Vandersloo says she thought her family, family was innocent. Now she, quote, doesn't know what to think. Mrs. Vandersloo says she believes her son is being unfairly targeted simply because he was one of the last people to see Natalie Holloway. Anita Vandersloo says her son, Yaron, is mentally strong. But she also thinks the interrogations would have broken him down by now if he knew anything. The Dutch teen's mother says a meeting with Holloway's mother was very emotional, and she can't understand why Holloway thinks Euron and the others being detained no more than they've already told investigators. Vandersloot says her son is just an ordinary teenager who is getting ready to go to college in the U.S. She says, why would a boy with a normal life, quote, do something wrong to a girl he had just met? Now, you would think that the authorities would be questioning our main suspects, of course that being the three men that were last seen with Natalie. But in reality, it took them nine days to bring any of them in for questioning, and this was only after mounting pressure from Natalie's family and government officials. And this is precisely why time is always of the essence in these cases, because by the time they arrested these three men, they had enough time to formulate their story. The two Calpo brothers, who were last seen in the car with both Joran and Natalie, told the authorities that they'd dropped them off at the beach before then returning home. In his separate interview, Joran claimed the exact same thing. However, this new story differed from the one he gave to Natalie's parents. In this new story, he claimed that shortly after arriving, he returned home, leaving Natalie alone on the beach. So, now we have a man who we know was with Natalie on the night she disappeared, was clearly into her, and had changed his story. Things just weren't adding up here. For over a month, the Kalper brothers and Joran van der Sloot were held by Aruban police as the investigation continued. On July the 4th, an Aruban judge ordered the release of Deepak and Satish, but demanded that Joran remained in custody and was held for at least another 60 days. Without any new information or leads, Natalie's family and various search teams were beginning to grow desperate. Imagine spending over a month on a foreign island, frantically searching for your child, who was now missing for several weeks. I've said it before, and I'll say it again. 
Sometimes silence is the loudest sound. Her absence was agonizing for all of those who loved her, and to add to the pain, no fresh evidence could be found. In what seemed to be a miracle break in the case, on July the 17th, search teams found a piece of duct tape on Aruba's northeast coast, not far from Nord, which conveniently is the town where Euron lived. And simultaneously, while this happened, both Deepak and Satish were re-detained. The tape appeared to have blonde strands of hair attached to it, and many believed that those hairs may have belonged to Natalie. But after sending the evidence for forensic testing, the sample returned with a negative match, therefore throwing the Holloway family back into despair. Things took a turn for the worse, when then, only two weeks later, both Joran and the brothers were officially released from custody, frustratingly leaving them free to roam the island and afar once again. With the release of all primary suspects and no new leads, the investigation had unfortunately ground to a halt. What was once a fast-paced and desperate search had now shifted into a slowly churning mess of arrests, lies, and, even at one point, extortion. Weeks turned into months, and as those months extended into 2006, Joran had firmly remained in the public spotlight. But in March 2006, 10 months after Natalie's disappearance, Joran was given the chance to tell his side of the story through an interview with Fox News. Here, he detailed the night Natalie disappeared, and further claimed that he had left her on the beach before returning home. And as for some of the more peculiar details, well, listen for yourself. How do you think you've been portrayed in all this? I think I've been portrayed unfairly. I think it's about time that people get to see the other side of the story. Are you ready to tell the truth? Yeah. Did you kill Natalie Holloway? No. Did you harm Natalie Holloway? No. And why should you be believed after all the lying that you've done in this situation? There's absolutely no reason to believe me. This so-called tell-all interview did nothing to change the public opinion on your own. To Natalie's family and the rest of the islanders, he was definitely hiding something. Later in December that year, Natalie's parents turned their focus to the other two men in this case, hoping they would know something about their daughter. And so, in hopes of getting fresh information from Deepak or Satish, they filed a wrongful death lawsuit against them. However, despite feeling confident, they were let down only six months later when the judge dismissed the lawsuit. Much of the same continued throughout the year of 2007. Natalie's parents were desperate for new progress, and although our three main suspects were re-arrested, they would then be released only one month later. None of the boys were changing their stories, and time seemed to be eroding people's hopes of finding any fresh evidence. By 2008, the police in Aruba had enough. Nothing new had cropped up in the last year and a half, and sadly, it was at this point that the island's chief prosecutor, Hans Moss, declared the case closed. This was much to the dismay of Natalie's parents. Her mother, filled with grief, made a public statement to say that she was now convinced she would never see her daughter alive again. However, while this was happening and halfway across the world, a savvy reporter was presented with a rather unique opportunity, that being the chance to trap Joran van der Sloot in an undercover sting operation. Alongside one of Joran's new friends, Dutch reporter Peter de Vries was tasked by the authorities to set him up, earn his trust, and hopefully extract a confession out of Joran. But if executed properly, it could be precisely what they needed to confirm his involvement in Natalie's disappearance. And the plan? Well, it worked. Joran admitted that, once he and Natalie were alone on the beach, she started convulsing. Unfortunately for him though, this confession was recorded by a secret camera. The confession is in Dutch, so there's not much point in playing it, but this is the infamous video that caught him off guard. Unable to revive her, Joran then called a friend and asked him to help with the body. And this supposed friend then told Joran to go home, before he then took her body out to the sea. Once this video came to light, the public outcry was absolutely massive. It appeared that the case had now been solved, at least somewhat, and everyone looked to Joran for an immediate response. Of course, Joran insisted that he was lying the entire time, and merely making up a story to impress his new friend, and that nothing, in the end, was factual as he claimed. And so, the frustrating pattern continued. The Holloway family desperately searched for answers holding out hope while the men who knew what happened remained silent, simultaneously just out of reach of prosecution. Despite Aruba's public prosecutor's office announcing the reopening of the case after Euron's video footage was released, the investigation was still in the same state when it was closed, that being ice cold. By 2010, five years had passed since Natalie's disappearance, 
But this was a year that marked a very definite change. And all of this was due to Joran's ever-increasing depravity. In a surprising yet twisted display of greed, Joran contacted the Holloway family's lawyer named Kelly to offer the location of their daughter's body in return for $275,000 cash. Joran demanded $25,000 up front, with the following $250,000 once the body was found. And so, after rapid communication with the family, Kelly responded and agreed, before relaying the information to the FBI. So let's take a moment here to pause and reflect, because I think that's rather important. But this man, who had already caused so much pain, anger and despair on the family, was now willing to extort them for money. That's just absolutely disgusting. It all makes sense really, because the family was so desperate to find out what happened to Natalie. And of course, that money could always be captured back. Taking the family lawyer to his father's house, Joran claimed that his father had actually buried Natalie's body within the building's foundation, which was now impossible to extract. With this information exchanged, the family lawyer gave Joran an additional $15,000. And now, with $25,000 in his bank account, Joran boarded the next flight to Peru. However, the US Department of Justice had been following Joran's transactions. And of course, they were not planning to let him get away scot-free. And so, on June the 3rd, 2010, he was charged with extortion and wire fraud. Later that month, he was officially indicted. But, as we are about to learn, Joran was in even hotter water in Peru. The date was May the 30th, 2010. And in the city of Lima, police were investigating a missing persons report for a young woman who had vanished only a few days prior. Meanwhile, in a nearby hotel, staff were doing routine room cleaning when they suddenly stumbled upon a grisly scene. A maid had walked into the hotel room to find the dead body of a young woman. It was eventually learned that the body belonged to 21-year-old Stephanie Flores Ramirez. As it turns out, the room was rented in Joran van der Sloot's name, but by the time the authorities had figured this out, Joran was, of course, nowhere to be found. And in a sick coincidence, he had murdered Stephanie on the five-year anniversary of Natalie's disappearance. Officially on the run, he did his very best to evade the authorities in South America. Fleeing Peru, he cut and dyed his hair red, and then made his way to Chile. But this wouldn't last forever, because only four days later, our slime bag was spotted taking a taxi in the beach city of Vina del Mar, where, no surprise, he was then promptly arrested. And after being taken back to Lima, he was placed in a high security prison where he then confessed to the killing. The bombshell confession came late last night. Under intense questioning, the 22-year-old Joran reportedly told investigators that he attacked Stephanie Flores. He grabbed her by the neck when she took his laptop, he said, and started reading articles about him on the internet. I did not want to do it, he tearfully admitted. The girl intruded into my private life. She had no right. I confronted her. She was frightened. We argued, and she wanted to get away. I grabbed her by her neck, and I hit her. Stephanie Ramirez was a student in her third year of business administration when she met Joran while playing poker. And after wanting to continue playing poker online, she went back with him to his hotel. According to Joran, he snapped after catching Stephanie snooping through his computer. When confronted, she admitted that she was searching for information that could link him to Natalie. And in his anger, he killed her in cold blood. Following a reasonably laminar trial, Joran was sentenced to 28 years in prison for the murder of Stephanie Ramirez. He was also ordered to pay 75,000 sol in reparations, the equivalent of 20,000 US dollars or 16,000 pounds. And so, despite doing his very best to evade Natalie's murder, it would be a second murder in her name that would eventually catch him. Now, you may have realized that I skimmed over Stephanie's murder, and that was for a very good reason. I plan to share her story and her voice in another video in a few days' time, so be ready for that. We're being brief with the details here for simplicity's sake. But in 2014, Joran married his then girlfriend, 24 year old Lady Figuero. With the baby now on the way, Joran sat behind bars and reflected on his actions. He knew that, no matter what, he wouldn't get out any time soon. Set to remain there for the next 26 years, he would then be sent back to the US to serve time for extortion of Natalie's family. And maybe with this in mind, 
he grew weaker in his determination to maintain his silence over Natalie's death. On May the 10th, 2023, Peruvian officials announced that they were giving Yoran over to the US to face charges of wire fraud and extortion related to his 2010 indictment. Legally called a request for temporary surrender, Yoran was to be charged on US soil before then being brought back to Peru to serve his Peruvian time. Natalie's mother weighed in with her own opinion too, sharing that, finally, there seemed to be some sense of justice served for her daughter's death. But Joran was not going to make this easy for anyone. Facing the court, he pleaded not guilty to his charges of extortion and wire fraud. And after that, he was then transferred to a county jail where he had more time to think about what lay ahead. I mean, Joran had already started his Peruvian jail time, and now, with the charges before him, he realized that he may have an even lengthier process in America. And so, with all of that in mind, he realized he had to change his attitude. Now, you can probably see where this is going, but after returning to court, Yoren was offered to make a plea deal. If Yoren were to plead guilty to his charges of extortion and wire fraud, and furthermore give a full confession of what happened to Natalie, then he'd receive only 20 years behind bars, and furthermore, be exempt from any future murder charges. And no surprise, he took it. He pleaded guilty and put everything on the table and the story that he shared between him and Natalie would be just as terrible as you'd expect. Joran claimed that, after hitchhiking a ride from Deepak and Satish, he and Natalie found themselves alone on the beach. Joran had one thing on his mind under the moon that night, of course, that being sex. He put on his charm and tried to coerce Natalie. At first, she didn't seem to mind the attention, but after he became pushy, she clarified that she was not interested in anything physical with him. As Yoran became more forceful, so did Natalie's resistance. She pushed him off of her, but sadly, Yoran became increasingly aggressive. He then kicked her extremely hard in the face, sending her sprawling back onto the sand unconscious. In a fit of rage, he picked up a nearby cinder block before barbarically bringing it down on her head, crushing her skull and ending her life in the process. Yoran knew that if he had any chance of getting away with her murder, he couldn't just leave her here. That is when he dragged her into the moonlit ocean and let her body float away. The described scene was intense, and the emotions felt in the courtroom formed a terrible cocktail of grief rage, sadness, and closure. And despite finally knowing that the daughter would never return home, her family at least finally knew what had happened. And with his terrible confession now laid bare for the entire world to hear, Joran van der Sloot was returned to Peru to continue his first of two separate sentences. He has this sentence, they're gonna let him serve it concurrently, so he's, he's not gonna serve any time in an American jail, he's going back to Peru. Well, he might, and so if, for folks who might be a little bit confused about, well, why is he here now going back to Peru? As Sam said, it's because he actually was convicted of killing another young woman, and because that conviction came first, he still has to serve out that prison sentence in Peru. But if for whatever reason, say he got out of prison early in Peru, he would be immediately transferred back to the United States to serve out the rest of the 20-year sentence that he has for killing Natalie. Yoran now sits behind bars in a Peruvian prison, where he is scheduled to be released in the year 2043. After that, he will be flown to an American prison and remain there until 2063. Ultimately, despite their daughter being gone and no official charge for her murder being made, the Holloway family feel satisfied with the justice brought to Yoran van der Sloot. After nearly 20 years of suffering and in the face of uncertainty, Dave and Elizabeth Holloway stood strong and fought for justice for their daughter. And of course, George for his stepdaughter. And now, at the end of their journey, and with her killer behind bars, they may finally find closure through this tragedy, and remember their daughter for who she really was. Natalie was a beautifully bright girl, and a friend to all. And despite her life cruelly ending early, the impact she had on the people around her is remarkable and can still be felt to this day. This is a very wild story when you think about it, with more twists and turns than I can even begin to count. To this day, Natalie's body has never been found, and sadly, it's unlikely to ever be recovered. I think though folks, that just about concludes our case today. As I mentioned before, I'll be making a second video on Stephanie's story, as she deserves just as much attention as Natalie received. I mean, there is so much more to cover on Euron's childhood, his father, and of course, Stephanie's story. But yeah, that's for a second video. Anyway folks, that's the end of the video. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, I'll see you again very soon for another one. Until that moment arrives though, remember to look after yourself, look after each other, and of course, stay safe.
thank you and goodbye.